Over the past few years, we've talked a lot about the opioid crisis in this country, but a forthcoming documentary is now looking at addiction in a new way, examining the science behind why it's so easy to get hooked on these drugs and nearly impossible to quit them. Individuals struggling with addiction are actually battling millions of years of evolution because our brains are exquisitely evolved to seek rewards, to seek reinforcement wherever and whenever we can. All drugs of abuse cause this unnatural rise of dopamine. And because of that, they're among the most powerful experiences our brains can have. The film chronicles the rise in prescription painkillers and the heroin addiction that follows for many, leading to a record 72,000 overdose deaths in one year, 2017 alone. The backdrop of the documentary is Welch, West Virginia. It's an old coal mining town where the poverty rate soared in the 90s as mining jobs vanished, and then came the drugs with more than 780 million pain pills flooding the state over a six-year period. I had no idea how dangerous pain medication would be. I never woke up any day and said, man, I want to be an addict today. Many times I would lay my head on a pillow and think, I'm done. I can't live like this. I don't want to be this person. And I would wake up the very next day and I would just do more drugs. I was powerless over my addiction. It consumed me. It owned me. I was a slave to it. While many, like Mark, tried to get help, they found in the end it wasn't so easy. It's one of the messages the film's producer took away as well, who joins me now, Sarah Holt. It's producer with Nova. We're also joined by Dr. Laura Kehoe, one of the doctors featured in this documentary. She's the medical director of the Substance Use Disorder Bridge Clinic at MGH. Good to meet you and good to see you, Sarah. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank it's you. pretty clear, obviously, among your goals to show addiction is not a moral failing, but a, a physical disorder. Why do we have such a hard time accepting that? You know, I think it's because people look at some of the behavior that accompanies addiction. They see people obsessively consuming drugs despite negative consequences, sometimes stealing money, you know. And so I, what is it? Why don't they just stop? Is that what so people think? One, one person said to me, I stopped smoking cigarettes. Why can't? Why can't they just stop? And I think one of the things I wanted to do with the show was to help people understand how painful opioid withdrawal is. You showed it uh, in incredibly powerful fashion. One of the other goals, doctor, is that this is a very treatable illness, but it seems to me to get people to believe that you have to get past the stigma. That's another thing I don't understand. Why does the stigma continue to be such a prevalent thing in the world around opioid addiction? Right. I think it's multifold. I think the, what Sarah Holt said, one is that the behavioral manifestations of untreated addiction is so hard for people to understand that it's actually reflective of a brain disorder. And so unlike other disorders that relapse and are chronic, meaning we don't have cures for, but we have treatments for, like heart disease, mm -hmm. where people can be in recovery with their blood pressure, with their chest pain because of medications and behavioral interventions and support. They don't see that with addiction, the brain is the organ that's affected and therefore behaviors are there. But to get people to actually um, engage in care, we also have to work on the stigma that people have from within, from many years of maybe interfacing with treatment modalities that aren't based in evidence, that aren't welcoming to people with addiction. And the, the medical community really needs to look, have introspection on how we've managed it. Yeah, I want to talk, or yeah. how you haven't managed it. I right. want to talk about Correct. the medical community Correct. in a minute. Yes. One of the things you do, which is great, I, it, it's great to identify a problem and explain it. You explain it so clearly and well, but without solutions, it doesn't get us terribly far. Where were you trying to take people on the solution front there, Sarah? Well, I saw two solutions. One, I think we, start, we need to start embracing treatments that are effective especially the medicated assisted treatments for opioid addiction. And affordable and accessible. Affordable mm -hmm. and accessible, but also there's so many steps we could be taking right now with harm reduction to save lives. Every dollar spent on harm reduction saves up to $7 in medical cost. You, know, you, are you, you are the one in the film, I saw it a couple of days ago, so yeah. my apologies yeah. if I get it wrong, who was railing against the 12-step 
program. Wasn't it you who was doing well, this? Well, I wouldn't say really. No, no, no. I, I want to be kind of need to bristle yeah, yeah. at that. Yes. But I mean, it, it, who, for those who believe that that's a fix yes. or a cure for yeah. this. So for the, the, people, that, the people that 12-step or AA, NA is helpful for, it's incredibly life-saving. And it absolutely breaks the isolation. But in terms of um, what we know with modern medicine, the analogy in medicine, what we do is we stratify people, their mm -hmm. illnesses, by, by severity. So mild, moderate, and severe. And the stark reality is the majority of people that we're seeing with this illness are presenting with severe, or as my colleagues say, metastatic opioid use disorder. And so that treatment modality by just kind of bringing in peer support for an advanced stage Doesn't illness that it. requires medication, support, et cetera, is completely mismatched. You know, I worried when, when I was watching the first 30 minutes of this, I thought you were gonna educate me and others like me brilliantly and totally ignore the notion that even if people get it, it, understand yeah. what's real that you know all of our problems are solved but then you have people like this someone suffering from addiction formerly suffering from addiction and the mother of someone formerly suffering from addiction talking about trying to find treatment here they are I wanted to get help but every place that I called didn't have beds available I felt like that if I didn't do something that I would end up dead I went on the internet and searched, and it's overwhelming. There are so many different places out there. You don't know who's good, who's bad, who's just trying to make money. Financially, our insurance covered nothing. We really tried to find the best treatment possible out there. But in America, there's not a lot of support in the mental health, um, and especially in substance abuse. Her son died after she thought the, yeah. he was pulling it back together. You were going to say something. So, yes, yeah, so I'd love to speak to that. I mean, I, whenever I see this, and this is what we see in clinic all the time with families that are coming in with loved ones or, unfortunately, people coming in alone, many people, it's a disease of isolation, is that when you think of other illnesses like cancer treatment, can you imagine a mother mm -hmm. looking on the Internet trying to find an oncologist that would be willing to take the patient? Will their insurance cover it? That would be completely so why can insurance companies get away with this i mean if, if the of, evidence right. is there as powerfully as you present right. it that it is a physical disorder right they, well, addiction's not handled like any other right. medical disorder it it's goes not back part of the to deep-rooted stigma in multi levels of the medical community the government etc it's just not been viewed as an equally uh, as as worthy of treatment as other medical but I'm so kind of say I want to just ask the doctor one thing it, there is a pogo-esque problem though coming from your end Art Kaplan a medical ethicist yeah. is on a radio show every week is talking about they don't even tr teach addiction in most uh, medical schools well that's one of the biggest issues is that people are allowed to graduate through medical school without knowing about addiction, without knowing about pain, and then are expected when we are faced with patients with addiction to manage them in, in a very faulty system that is not equipped to manage them. So in, unless and until we treat medical students how to, to teach medical students how to treat addiction at the get-go, that doctors can't elect to choose to treat people with addiction, but it's expected that we will be as well-versed in treating people with addiction as we do heart disease and diabetes. Speaking of treating people with addiction, you're an outlier there at MGH. Tell mm -hmm. people what you do that so many other facilities do not do. Sure. So we offer um, readily available, very low threshold, immediate access care to patients, just like this patient mm -hmm. here, um, because what that treatment does is it reflects the illness, which is when people are in active addiction, in the throes of addiction, the parts of the brain that are affected mm -hmm. that allow them to make decisions is completely haywire. And so in these kind of highly structured programs that require patients to jump through all of these hoops to engage in care are not only uh, ineffectual, but they're actually leading to overdose deaths because the longer people wait to get on to treatment, we know that they're having significant um, outcomes. And now with fentanyl and carfentanyl and fentanyl analogs, every single time that somebody with an opioid use disorder uses, they're at real mm -hmm. risk risk of dying. Only have 15 seconds left. What do you hope? I mean, I learned a huge amount from this, I should say. Is that 
your primary goal here? What's the yes, takeaway? I hope you hope people understand that addiction is a brain disorder, not a moral failure. I do now. We should put it, bring it into the medical system, and, that and it's treat treatable. it like any other medical disease. Your insurance should pay for that yeah. treatment, and that it's treatable, and that our system now is this heterogeneous approach to care, and what's passed as addiction really has not been has not met what we know about this, the science and the illness of this. If you want to learn more about this, but they're both going to join Marjorie Egan and me on Boston Public Radio on Wednesday, so stay tuned. It's a pleasure okay. to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Thank Doctor. you. Thanks so, so nice much. To meet Appreciate you. your time. Nova Addiction premieres this Wednesday at 9 p.m. right here on GBH2. You can find out more information online at wgbh.org slash Nova.